So, um, making a new Ember app is this easy. If I want to go Ember new, uh, have a great night. Pew, pew, pew. We're, uh, we're already installing a, a new Ember app. Pretty cool stuff, right? So if I want to skip ahead to one that I've already got all the, all the stuff on, uh, I can go to... Oh, I got a... Oh, right. Good call. Much as we love looking at your face. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can see the code in my eyes. Uh, so is that, that good, Dave? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, OK, so this is the, uh, the Easy Bake Oven. Everything's good to go. So we look at the uh, directory structure for this. How about we throw this in a TMUX session because we're bosses. Um, and call this the editor, and vim it up. OK, so here's our directory tree. Uh, if you've been doing this for a bit, this probably looks like, uh, wow, best practices, best, best practices all over the place. We've got stuff for our public folder. That's like our assets, any of that kind of stuff. We've got room for our tests. Vendor is all of our min and catted and whatever else uh, libraries. No modules, power components, and then we need to configure our builds, the actual build distributions, and our, uh, our app files. This is where most of the magic happens. We've got components, controllers, uh, models, routes, uh, and lions and tigers and bears. Oh, good call. All right. Thank um, you. So uh, let's say uh, we want to fire this thing up. Remember, this is a, we just did Ember new, named an app. We didn't do anything special. And if I, oh man, I'm screwing up. I'm getting nervous and I'm forgetting all my Tmux commands. This is going to fire up our, uh, our built-in web server. And ta-da, we are now serving this, uh, this fresh app on localhost 4200. So if we go over here, hey, there's our new app. So let's say we want to edit some stuff on that. That looks a little bit familiar, right? We got uh, an H2 with Welcome to Ember. And oh, there it is. So if I say Welcome to Ember Denver and save. Oh, wow, I didn't have to do anything special. Auto refresh for me. That's pretty cool. So this outlet thing down here, this means that if I nest any kind of uh, view or template, whatever, whatever you want to call it, inside of this, then that's going to show up there. So let's, uh, let's add something. Call this the shell, and we'll say ember generate route. Uh, I'm going to call it coffee. And then we're going to go over and look at this router, which Steve's talking about tonight. And here's this new route. So the idea on the router, which Steve will go into way more depth, I'm sure, is the idea of tying a URL to a, uh, to a route. So if we go to our localhost 4200 and we go slash coffee, it's going to hit this route, which has a this handler right here. So how about we do that? All right, nothing special because there's nothing in that template. So this route is going to help instantiate the, uh, the template, which is right here. If I say, uh, I like coffee, Oops. holy smokes, there it is. Uh, so this is a core concept in Ember that URLs are important. And we'll, uh, we want to build views. We're tying those to URLs and kind of nesting them inside of each other. Let's say I want to grab some data. I got like a list of uh, coffee things or something. I'm not a coffee person. I'm a, I'm a Diet Coke guy. Uh, big K brand if you have it. So <laughs> I'm going to generate an HTTP mock uh, called coffee. 
and uh, NPM is going to spin on that for a sec, and um, I'm going to hop over to the server folder that just got made, over to Mox, Coffee. Who knows what this looks like? Yeah. What is it? It's an, it's an Express app. So like, it, whether you're using that or not, it's pretty easy syntax to get your head around. So let's say I want a, a list of coffee things. So I'll make two of these. I'll give this one an ID and a name, and it's Sumatra. As I said, I'm not really a coffee guy, so what's another kind of coffee? Java? Is that a, is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing a great job. So um, I've made a, uh, an express route now that when I go to slash coffee, I'm going to get uh, this array back that has these things. And if I then go make a model called coffee here and back into my app over models and coffee and coffee has uh, a name that was the only property I had on there right and I go back over here to this coffee route I'm going to have a model hook so every time we go into this URL we hit the uh, the route. We have a, a lifecycle hook for model, and this is going to return looking up something on the uh, the Ember store, which is a collection of all the uh, the records that are available. Find me all that coffee. Watch, this is going to work. Uh, oh, I did. No. Oh. That's a good idea. <laughs> By the way, when you do one of these, you should have three beers before you do it. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, cool. So, and I go over here and our PPP. All right, that get. Coffees. Plurals and singulars, man. So it's down here. Let's just call it that. And then we need to make a data adapter. So we're going to make an adapter and we're going to call it application. So this is what uh, uh, Wasmer is going to talk about in his presentation is how these things work. So, yeah. Go over here to. Adapters. And so what these do, and Dave will go into way more detail about this, is when I say, I want coffee, uh, it's going to translate that request for, uh, for coffee into some URL for some, some API that follows some kind of standard. It could be RESTful, it could be sockets, it could be whatever, but we're able to keep our code in Ember uh, the same. We're able to swap out what uh, the URL structure for that looks like. Switch that is going to be API, and all right, back in business there. So let's hop back over to all right. So we've got all that uh, all that coffee available, and on this route, what if I did a each um what's the new syntax? It's each each coffee as, yeah, each coffee as model, and uh, crap. And when I go uh, make template kind of thing that says look up that coffee name it 
Let's see if this works. Probably didn't. Um, and no, it's coffee is the thing, right? Yeah. Oh, that that's what I was trying to figure out. Surprisingly, get a bunch of uh, Ember developers in here, and maybe we can figure out how to how to make this beginner thing. Oh, holy shit! Um, so uh, think about what we did there. We set up something that has internal routing. We have something that has a built-in mock data server. We have a, a replaceable data adapter. We've got nested routing on here. And uh, if that wasn't enough, if I go to this URL test, then, oops, no, never mind. If we go to this URL test, oh shit, we've been running an entire testing framework in the background too. So you saw what three beers Kyle was able to do in <laughs> like 10 minutes with Ember. Uh, think about what you could do if you spent a little bit of time and had three less beers than this. Uh, anyway, that's, a, that's an idea of how much we can get done in a very small amount of time uh, with Ember. Pretty neat stuff. Ooh, ah, coffee. Way to go, Kyle. Applause. <laughs> so, uh, at this point, I would like to turn the stage over to Mr. Dave Wasmer, who's going to be talking about adapters and serializers. Yeah. I have not had three beers, so. You got six. <laughs> Yeah, cool. All right. Hey, there we go. All right. Sorry for the uh, slow start here, folks. Almost ready. Entire screen. Share. Oh. <laughs> Brain hurts. Let's just stare at that for a minute. <laughs> Who needs the beard? <laughs> All right. Insert appropriate inception joke. Uh, preview? All right. Let's give this a shot. OK, so <clears throat> this is going to be a relatively quick tour of adapters and serializers. And uh, I figured I'd talk about this topic because I've been dealing with this a lot lately. <laughs> and I've started to dig in some, some of the internals. Uh, and I've realized that some of the folks I've talked to don't necessarily understand all of the uh, tools that are available in the adapter and serializer sort of toolkit that comes with Ember data. Um, so that's me, um, Dave Wasmer, DaveWasmer.com, obligatory introduction. Um, so, to start off, what, what problem are we solving? So basically, if you think about a framework like Ember Data, what is its task? You know, it has to essentially allow you to connect to almost any API you can think of. And maybe it's not even an API. Maybe it's another data source. Maybe it's local storage or something like that. So that's a pretty ambitious task. And it's a good thing that the tagline is building ambitious web applications, right? So it's a, a big task in front of us. And there's a lot of complexity to try to deal with. And Honestly, I think Ember does a great job of presenting what is, at first glance, a very simple way of tackling that problem. But there's a lot of depth there that allows you to tackle some very advanced situations. Um, <clears throat> that's just to reiterate. So it's sort of a Tower of Babel problem, right? So you could have APIs that are SOAP-based XML APIs that are WSDL driven that, if you guys don't know what those terms are, Jealous of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on the flip side, you know, you could have a very sort of modern, like a Rails backend that's using active models um, or uh, active serializers, that kind of stuff. Um, so it, it's a broad spectrum, and it and it goes beyond just sort of 
what the JSON structure of your API looks like, um, because there's a lot of, of other things here. So when we talk about communicating with a backend of, of some kind, and that could be local storage right in the browser, that could be an API, that could be any number of things, there's a lot of stuff for us to try to think about. So I, just off the top of my head, I try to just sort of come up with some ideas here. And there's three groups I came up with of things that Ember data has to deal with. Um, there's transports. Uh, so obviously, Ajax is probably one of the most popular ones, but there's other ones as well. There's Socket.io, WebSockets of some kind, uh, local storage. I guess there's not really a transport involved with that, but you get the idea. Um, there's uh, protocols, so you know, or, or specs or standards, or whatever you want to call these. So obviously, uh, for those of you who are familiar with it, you know, Ember Data has sort of adopted JSON API as the standard that it sort of follows. But there are other competing ones as well. There's HAL or HAL, I don't know how that's usually pronounced. SOAP is another one, uh, and there's a plethora of others as well. And then the last bit here is is authentication. So there's a, a million different ways you can authenticate, right? And most of your communication with some kind of backend is going to need to have some knowledge of that, right? So if you're talking to a backend that's using just simple cookies, your requests are going to need to know that. If you're using an authentication header, you need to know uh, authorization header, you need to add that authorization header to every Ajax request, right? So there's a lot of complexity here, and Ember Data's job is to encapsulate this and allow you to connect to any backend that you need to, but also make it easy to connect to the ones that are relatively sane and that are common. And so rather than trying to come up with some kind of like, let's integrate with every or provide an option for every possible you know, transport or authentication protocol or that kind of thing, instead, as I mentioned or hinted at earlier, Ember Data has sort of taken the, this opposite approach and said basically, oops, slides are out of order. Oh, oh, wait, there we go. Basically just saying JSON API, please. That's all it cares about. So internally, uh, as of recent versions of Ember, uh, everything internally in Ember data works off of the JSON API spec. And it's great because it gives a sort of a common format, a common language, a common understanding of what Ember data expects. And basically, it's up to us as the developers, the application developers, to account for any deviation from that spec, right? So if you have a backend that doesn't necessarily wrap you know, your JSON responses uh, with some kind of, you know, wrapper object like you might see in JSON API, then it's up to us to make sure that we transform that into what JSON API looks like. And then Ember Data will understand it. It keeps the core of Ember Data relatively straightforward, but then allows you to basically be responsible for adapting whatever it is uh, that you're working with. And that's sort of a, a hint right there is adapter. So let me go back to the way the slides should be in order. There we go. So this is Ember Data's rough structure for trying to deal with connecting to an API of some kind. You, you've got serializers and adapters are two core concepts to work with. And a serializer, uh, you can think of it as what is sent? What is the actual payload of the data? Like how is it formatted? How is it structured? And the adapter represents how it's sent. So for example, if you were using uh, WebSockets, you, know, you might use a different adapter because it's a different transport layer but you could still send the same JSON API payload object over WebSockets, and that would belong in the serializer. So you can separate these two concerns, something that Ember tends to be pretty good at is you know, finding these lines of responsibility and dividing between them. And this lets you uh, easily you know, interop and switch things around. And so one of the common uh, sort of stumbling blocks that I've seen a lot is a lot of people can get confused about what code is supposed to go where. And in particular, I see a lot of people adding what is ultimately serializer code to their adapters. So, and it's very tempting, especially if you come from a background where you've been working more with something like jQuery and you know, direct Ajax calls a lot of the times. It's easy to go into the adapter and say, hey, look, there's this Ajax method. Like I can just you know, override that and add this thing here and transform the payload or whatever. But ultimately, enforcing that separation of concerns makes your app more robust. Because let's say in the future, you know, you want to switch to use supporting WebSockets for your app as well, in addition to just a standard Ajax. If you have properly separated out your code, all you need to do is just add the new WebSockets adapter, potentially, and you should be good to go. Like, you don't need to change the serializer. You don't need to change the way your payloads are sent. And your server will be happy as well, because it gets to deal with the same payload, whether it's coming from an Ajax call or from a WebSockets message. 
So it's valuable to understand these lines of responsibility and make sure that when you do add code, it goes in the right location because ultimately it makes your app more robust in the long term. And so for me, at least, I've come up with sort of a rule of thumb of like if you're trying to figure out where does this code go, where does it belong. Um, in general, you should ask yourself, if you change transport layers, would this impact the code? Does it have to impact the code? If the answer to that is yes, as a rule of thumb, so there are exceptions, I'm sure somebody will come up with one, um, it should belong in the adapter. So for example, if you are dealing with adding an authorization header to your AJAX requests, well, that's going to be in the adapter, because if you change to WebSockets, there's no headers. You don't, that's not something you deal with, right? Uh, on the flip side of that, if you say um, we want our attribute keys to be um, transformed from underscored to camel case when they come in from the server, that has nothing to do with AJAX or WebSockets, right? Like those could be equally applicable to both situations. So that's a great situation where that belongs in the serializer instead. So that's kind of the, the rule of thumb and the slides out of order. Um, and so to, to, to kind of finish off, I just wanted to go over a couple sort of integration examples, basically some tactics and scenarios that I've encountered and I've, I've, people I've worked with have encountered, and to kind of give you a sense of, of how you might be able to tackle some problems you might encounter in the future. Um, so the first one is uh, the obligatory meme image. Uh, use the hooks. So there's a lot of hooks that are available in Ember data. Uh, if you just look through the docs, it's, it's kind of staggering at times. Um, a lot, for example, a lot of junior developers I've worked with um, who are you know, just starting out in Ember don't realize that there is this primary key property on the serializer. So if your backend is, let's say, Mongo, and by default, all of your uh, you know, IDs come back as underscore ID rather than just regular old ID, um, you can just set the primary key property on your serializer to be underscore ID string, and Ember takes care of all of it for you. You know, I've seen junior developers like going in and ripping up internals of the serializer and like deleting the underscore ID key. I'm like, you don't have to do any of that. It's all there for you. Just use the tools that you have. Um, that's the that's the trivial example, but there's more robust examples as well. So let's say your uh, your server decides that anytime it's going to return multiple records, um, rather than returning array, it wants to return an object that doesn't necessarily correspond to any spec or anything like that, and they want to throw in a couple extra keys for good measure or just for fun, you know. You can say something like normalize array response, and that will allow you to basically take, take whatever that you know, messy object is, pull out the data you need, and then hand it over to Ember, again, in that JSON API formats like it expects. So there's a lot of those kinds of things. Those are both serializer properties or hooks, by the way. Um, the find has many is an example of an adapter hook. So uh, if you've ever used uh, Ember data with relationships, so you've got a book which has an author, you can say book.getAuthor. And if your server returns links in the payloads, or if you add them yourself in the serializer layer, then Ember data will automatically fetch the right URL from the server. So it'd be like books slash, you know, book ID slash authors or something like that. Um, and it will use the find has many method. So it's not just some generic, like, make a request to the server. There are specific hooks that you can override for each step of the process, for each type of request, for each type of response. And the goal here is it's important to find the hook that is smallest for the task you have at hand. Because it's very tempting to take the general normalize hook, which is sort of the entry point to normalizing any server response that comes back at all. It's tempting to override that and just hack something into place. But the problem is that you're bludgeoning a bunch of Ember data code that you don't realize, right? Like Ember data has a ton of internals that are very valuable and very well thought out, probably more thought out than I have time to think through in my day job, right? And so the reason there are these many hooks is it gives you small slices that you can customize and then leave everything else untouched so that when Ember data 2.7 comes out or whatever, you'll get all the benefits that affected that other part of the code base because you haven't overridden it. It's all just the default, right? You just do upgrade your Ember version, and you're there. So that's an important concept to keep in mind is anytime you're dealing, and this is, is true outside of Ember data, but I think especially with Ember data, there's, there seems to be a lot of confusion about this. In general, you want to find the smallest hook you can possibly find and just override that. So these are the trivial examples. These are the, the basic ones. Like, OK, you know, my ID is something other than just ID. Um, or you know my my server returns a weird object or something like that. 
But there are some more complex examples, and there's one example actually that I'll, I'll show now, which I've had to deal with recently, which was interesting. Um, so I had an API that looked kind of like this. And um, it wasn't books, but it's just the example. So it was the same endpoint, but depending on which book you fetched, the response structure was different, which was like, I stared at my monitor for like half an hour when I was like, how do I, what, I don't, they're, they're both books, why are they different? So that was, that was like a mental hurdle for me to overcome. Thankfully, at least, the API returned a schema version. So, okay, I, I can at least, I don't have to like duct type it. Like, do you have an array for authors or do you have a straight, like, it'll just tell me what version it is. Okay, that's helpful. So how do you deal with this kind of situation, right? So there's a lot of different ways we could do this. If you're, if you're dealing with the nice version of this situation, which is that just the structure of the payload is different, but the data isn't semantically different, then it's relatively simple. You just, you customize the right, the right serializer hooks, you, you add branching, you know, if it's version two, then serialize it the version two way. But in this particular case, the data was semantically different. So if you look author in books uh, one is just a single author. In books two, it's an array. And the, what was happening here under the hood was that the backend was going through a migration but it was a, a, a drawn out migration basically. They didn't just do one database migration all at once. Instead, it was a large production application and they wanted to make an internal schema change and they wanted to test it out first and do things slowly, right? Which makes sense. And so that, that change leaked through the API. And so what happened is we couldn't tell ahead of time based on just the ID of the book if that book had been migrated to the new structure or not. And so we needed to account for both. And in the new structure, books were allowed to have multiple authors. And this is really like, in, in some sense, a, a related object. It's like the authors could be their own object in and of themselves. They didn't have a separate endpoint in the API. So this is the more challenging situation because the, the data is semantically different. So in this situation, uh, there's a couple strategies that we employed. Um, and the first step is to basically find the superset of the data that you need to support. So in this case, both versions of the schema, schema version one and schema version two, allow for authors. Schema version one allows for a single author, schema version two allows for multiple authors. But we could model schema version one as having multiple authors, it's just they always have one, right? So from our code's perspective, we could try to treat it as if books always have multiple authors, and then it just so happens that the schema one versions will never have more than one because the data from the server doesn't allow that. So this, oh, well. <laughs> exactly. Um, so the, the three sort of points that we came up with, the first was when the data comes in from the server, we normalized it all into the V2 structure internally in our Ember application. So we actually set up a relationship. So we had a book model and an author model and we said books has many authors. And in the data that came in from the server in the normalized hooks, we said, if it's a schema version one, then basically just wrap the author in an array, like treat it like it was multiple to start with. And then on the way back to the server, we reverse that process. So we hang on to the schema version number and we say, this was a version one book. So on the way back to the server, we unwrap that array and we just have the single author there for the server to use. So that's the first part of that, that equation. But the next part is that in the, the snippets I showed there was just a string for a name. But if the, in this case, the, the author was like a deeply nested object with its own properties. So one of the things to, to keep in mind is that Ember data has a tough time tracking changes on nested objects for a variety of reasons, which I can go into, but it does. Um, and so in this scenario, we didn't want to, to treat these authors as just nested objects in some array on the book. We wanted it to be a full-fledged model. We wanted to be able to address it on its own, have the relationship work both ways. So if I wanted to say author.getbooks, I wanted to be able to do that in the other parts of the Ember application. But the API did not have a slash authors endpoint. There was no way to address an individual author. So what we did is we actually have a client side only model for the author. So when the data comes back from the server, even though from the API perspective, it's not a separate resource, we treat it like it is. And we just treat it basically like the server's always embedding those resources in every response all of the time. 
So instead we have an author's model and we have its author's serializer and it's a full-fledged separate resource in our Ember application. But when it goes back to the server, it's always serialized back into a single payload every time. The drawback of this approach, for those of you who are paying attention, is that you can't call save on an author. We could get clever and override the save method, but then that starts to get tricky Like you know, if you want to do that. So that's the drawback of that approach. And then, like I said, anytime the data goes back to the server, we simply serialize it from whatever, from the internal v2 version into whatever it was originally when it came to us from the server. So if it was v2, it goes back as v2. If it was v1, we unwrap that array and we send it back that way. So that's an example, a more advanced example of how you can use some of these uh, approaches with Ember data using the right hooks, finding the smallest hook that you possibly can to override, to inject your own code, and then starting to, to change your thinking from saying, you know, my Ember data models don't necessarily have to one-to-one -to -one correspond with what the API and the server think. Like, there can be this disconnect. And because of the robustness of the API, uh, sorry, from the adapter and serializer layer, it's very easy to do that with Ember. You can have an entire structure inside your app that is not necessarily reflected in the API, but maybe it makes more sense for your app to behave that way. Um, so that's, that's kind of the rundown. Um, that's, that's it. Yeah! Thanks. Any questions? Holy cow. You see why I shouldn't be doing these? We just have people like Dave doing these. Maybe you're Dave that could be uh, talking to us next month. Another round of applause for Dave. Uh, OK, so uh, 180 seconds, three minutes to kind of stand up, wiggle around while Steve gets set up, and we're we'll right back into it. <laughs> uh. <laughs>
screen and uh, whatever screen you want to share. This one. Yep. So wait, wait, hold on. Wow. Boom. There you go. Right. So, um, again, I want to express my gratitude for everybody coming out tonight. Uh, we're not number one. We're not even number two anymore. But uh, I'm really grateful that we're where we're at because we're not owned by someone else. We're not owned by Google. We're not owned by Facebook. Uh, so we don't have to be I am. the greatest social network. You don't have to be the greatest search engine tool, and if uh, if whatever owner wants to go take a uh, framework in another direction, we don't have to run that way. This framework is owned by us. This community is owned by us. This is a community framework. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce. My better half in the uh, education world, uh, co-director of academics for the Turing School, and EmberConf 2015 uh, speaker, Steve Kenny. Um, all right, so disclaimers, as you know, that's probably the best thing to start out with. Um, so I was giving a talk on Friday, and six minutes before my talk, I dropped my computer. So this is like rando computer that I picked up out of Turing and tried to set my stuff up on. So you know. <laughs> Things might happen. It'll be cool. Uh, we'll figure it out. Um, yeah, real quick, I am the co-director of academics at the Turing School of Software and Design over on 15 and Blake. Um, so if you're looking to hire students, like they're here, hire them. That's it. <laughs> Done. Um, if you are looking to like mentor students, like Mike, did Mike leave? Where's Mike? Mike left. Uh, if you wanted to mentor students and then leave during my talk, you can be like Mike and do that. That'd be cool too. And like work with uh, some junior developers. Also, organizer of Nobots Colorado. Um, yeah, so if you want to build robots, I'm thinking about trying to schedule something in November because right after we announced that we were not going to, everyone's like, you totally should. And really, I'm a sheep. So I'll do it. It's cool. Let's make it happen. Um, so I'm actually going to talk a little bit today. Like I really like the kind of like the theme of the three talks right now. The theme of the three talks are like not like some like Ember add-on that you can totally use and like that's sweet, but like just like core features in Ember, right? Like how to Ember. Um, and so you know Kyle kind of just said like how do you get anything up and running, right? And then Dave looked at like all right adapters and serializers. I'm actually only going to talk about one thing today. Yay! Yeah. Uh, woo! Um, only talk about one thing, which is routing. Right, so like the router is long, long uh, known as like kind of the crown jewel of Ember, and probably the most opinionated part of Ember, right? And like the React router is based off of Router JS, which is like the Ember router ripped out of Ember, and so it's kind of also served as like the archetype for like router implementations in other frameworks, right? And like, what is a router? We're kind of used to like what a router is on the server, right? If you've ever made a Sinatra app or a Rails application in Ruby or an Express app. Right, what happens is, you know, you make a request to a server. Sweet, right? The, you know, there's usually like the server's running at like either a domain or like local host at a certain port. And everything after that slash is the resource that you're looking for, right? And in a lot of cases, if you have like a URL like this, basically what's happening is Rails, Sinatra, or Express are going through about all the, they're going through all the different like, routes and resources that they know about and trying to find one that le legit matches this pattern, right? So if you just said slash artist, but you can like start to nest them and basically it's gonna check through everything it knows until it finds one that matches that, right? And then it'll fire up the controller or the what, the what have you and whatnot um, that like will then deal with that and respond to it, right? And one of the really, really hard things for people new to Ember is understanding that that's not how it works in Ember, right? Um, that each each part of the of the route actually is meaningful to an Ember application, right? So like each segment between these slashes actually like fires up something in the router to fire up a route, which will grab a model and grab a controller, and then this will grab a totally different controller that's active at the same time as the other controller, and a different template and view that's active at the same time as this template and view. And this will actually fire up a third one that'll be nested one level deeper. So we actually have many controllers and many templates and many views and many like models that we might be fetching all at once at the same time, right? And one of the things that Ember finds really important is if you've ever gone to a, like a, 
uh, I don't mean to throw like bank websites under the bus, but fuck them. Right. Um, and they say like, whatever you do, don't hit the back button. Right, like that kind of breaks the web browser. Like there's a back button in my web browser, right? Um, all of the routing on the client side kind of uses this history API to like push stuff up and pop stuff on and like so on and so forth. Um, but like the really, the really interesting part is that each of these does something. So what we're gonna do tonight is we're actually gonna take a deep dive into a route, probably only about that far, because um, I think we're out of beer. Uh, <laughs> There is uh, the champagne of beers, if that interests you. Uh, it interests me. Um, so we're going to kind of look into, like, how, how would we go about, like, developing a route like this? And we have some constraints. Here are our constraints. Uh, we're going to use zero controllers. We're going to use zero views. We're going to use zero components. We are going to use one route, just one route file. Right, and the, like the trick here is that Ember spins up some under the hood. We are going to use one, right? Yeah, so I'm kind of lying to you. Um, and we're only going to use the router that's built into Ember, some templates, and one route. And what we're going to build is a little application I like to call Beard Beats. And uh, basically what it is, it's like the model is this idea of like an iTunes like app. You can find an artist, you select the artist, then you go ahead and you can grab the, you know, you see the artists that have many albums, you can click an album, you can see those songs. Right? We do this under the following constraints, right? And yeah, sometimes you're gonna like, there'll be a little voice inside of you. And the little voice inside of you will be like, I know a better way to do this. Cool. Um, <laughs> right? Keep that little voice quiet. Because um, the, the point here is to like use this as an, as an exercise to like deeply understand the router, right? And one of the, the mistakes I see very junior Ember developers make is they try to fight the router. Don't fight the router. <laughs> the router literally wins every time, right? But if you go along with the very, very strong opinions of the, of the router, you actually get a whole bunch of stuff for free that lets you say, I don't know, build like a music app with only templates and one route, right? All right, so let's take a look. Uh, let me just tell you what I already have in this app. It's kind of like a cooking show where I've got like the crust already made. Um, there's two things. There is a Rails server running in the background that's just like a basic API that knows about artists, albums, and songs, right? I literally made it in 20 minutes today when I found out that when I upgraded this to 2.1 so that it like, I could be like relevant, uh, that fixtures were deprecated in March of 2015. So like, I'm, yeah, uh, or to make a Rails app in 15 minutes, either or. Um, so that worked. Uh, so there is a Rails app running in the background. I used to use HTTP box and everyone said use fixtures. So I'm like, all right, I'm cool, I'll use fixtures. And then they abandoned them. Now I gotta use HTTP box again? Uh, so the, uh, the official stance on it is Igor told me. Igor is the primary way to remember data. Uh, uh, like months before they uh, deprecated it, he went, oh god, don't use those anymore. They were a good idea, but we've done them so, so wrong. So literally the documentation says nobody wants to maintain them anymore, so we remove them. Uh, and, but no, the thing that you're supposed to use in your quotes, well, what's the one that you guys use? Barrage. Barrage. Barrage is the, is the kit one that is supposedly so much better. HTTP is the like less path from remember. Cool. Uh, I made a Rails server. Because <laughs> that all confused me very much earlier today. Uh, so this is my CSS file. This is on my, yeah, you, you all came for the CSS file, right? No? All right. Um, uh, I just use Helvetica because I like it. Um, I change the link colors, but then I do this really obnoxious thing that shows about my like proficiency with CSS. So we got like the, a template class, which will give it a, like a border, and then like I keep going. <laughs> um, and that should be enough. And the point is, as we begin nesting templates and views, I would like to have obnoxious borders around them so you can see it. Right? Uh, there, there's like some kind of like borderline reasonable reason for this. Um, but yeah, uh, that works apparently, by the way. <laughs> Thing that I learned, uh, this works. Uh, it was one of those things, you know when you like go to do something, you're like, there's no way this is gonna work. <laughs> no way, this is never gonna work. And then it works, you're like, <laughs> um, So we got that, and then I've got my models. I'll just show them to you real quick. An artist has albums and they have a name. Um, album has a title and a year and belongs to an artist that has songs, and songs have a title, what track number they are, uh, how long they are. Um, to keep with the theme, I originally was just gonna make a music app, 
And then I was using, and then the idea of just only using artists that have beards came up. And then I realized that beard based is alliteration. Here we are. Um, so that's going to happen. Um, and so we'll kind of explore this. So that's really, other than a bare bones Ember app, that's really all I'm bringing to the table, right? So there's not a whole lot going on beyond that. Uh, I will push this code up uh, probably tomorrow. Like there is an older version uh, that I can give you right now. If you, if you need to go home tonight and do this, I can give you like the one, 111 version. But if you want to be on the, on the bleeding edge, wait a day. Um, cool. So we can fire that up. I actually have it fired up, but I don't trust the I don't trust computers. So I'm gonna kill that server and start it back up again. All right. Um, and we're gonna do some basic things. Now we get some routes for free. All right. This is again bare bones Ember app, CSS file. I have like an adapter um, and like these three models. We get some routes. We get some routes and some templates for free. And like. The, the big dog in the room is the application template and route, right? So if you were to go over to an app, hey, not the thing I was looking for. Uh, we go to localhost 4200. Um, we automatically get an application route, like out of the box. And we can, if we open up the Ember Spectre, hey, look, there's Ember. We can actually see our routes. We've got an application route, and we get an index route. The application route is kind of like the big, like overarching, like, Chrome around our application, right? And by default, it lives in this little um, handlebars file that comes with Ember called application HBS, right? Handlebars. And all I've done so far is I did my first template thing. This is just totally semantic for our, like, so we can keep track of stuff as we're going along. Um, I say welcome. I say that we are in the application HBS so that we can keep track of this. And we have this thing called an outlet. And an outlet, when we're doing stuff, when we like start to look at those routes, and all that is what each sub route and each sub template is loaded into, right? And so, like as we do a nested uh, thing, if you will, that's a technical term, it'll be loaded in the outlet, right? And but sometimes, like we haven't gone all the way down the route, the route. So like chances are we might stop here, or we might stop here. Right, and so one of the kind of um, abstractions that Ember gives us is this idea called an index, right? Index route and index template. It's basically if you have nothing to put in this outlet, go ahead and put this index in the outlet, right? It's kind of like on the regular old old school web is like if you have an index.html, you just go to a given like folder. It's the default page that's you know that's shown, right? So it's that kind of basic concept. It's if you have nothing else to put here go and put an index um, HBS in here, or the index route for whatever we're looking for. Um, so let's go ahead, and what we're going to do is we're going to create a template for that. So I'm going to say Ember G template. Hey, I'll even spell it right. Who knows? Uh, Ember G template index. Boom, and it creates app templates index. I can go back over, and here it is. And it's, it's amazing. Uh, it's an empty file. So I'm just going to put another some markup in here. So we're live coding, but there's a little copy paste action because nobody wants to watch me write HTML <laughs> while drinking the champagne of beers. Um, so here we're going to have an index template, right? And we'll just kind of announce what it is, and we'll save that over, and we'll hop over to our application, right? So you can see that our application template is kind of the big overarching one, and in our outlet we render the index template. We can go over here into the view tree. And we can do this hover thing, and like Ember will show us kind of this nested idea, right? That we're going to route one route. This has a this could have a route file. This could have a controller that is separate from the application control and the application route. Like it's again, it's really hard if you've done a lot of server side programming to wrap your head around this. But there's like any given part has its own controller. There are multiple controllers that can communicate with each other and like you know share information with each other. Um, so we have these two right here. Now this is great, but this is not. This is not what we want yet, right? So the first thing we have is this idea of artists, right? And what we want to do is we want to create um, a route, right? So the first part of our segment, if we go back, is this idea of artists. So like when we go to slash artists, we should see all of the artists. All right, so let's do that. Uh, I'm going to use generator. Uh, so I'll use Ember G route artists, plural. And you can see we get a few files made. We got a route file called uh, routesartist.js. 
and we get a template file called artist.hbs. Uh, we get one more thing happens is in our router, this gets modified, right? It puts a route in here for artists, right? And this is meaningful to the Ember router. Um, and so now if we flip back over to our application, go to routes, we can see that not only we have this artist route and the URL is slash artist. You can see like, hey, uh, Ember's got strong opinions. I want to name everything. What do I name the template? You name it artist. What do you name a controller? You name it artist. What do you name a route? You name it artist, right? There's a cheat sheet here. Right, and you can kind of look at what it has to be in any given moment. So I've got this artist um, like route, and I can go to slash artist. And that's weird, my index is gone, right? Because theoretically, the index uh, handlebar file was only for plugging up that outlet hole when there's nothing to put in there, right? Now we have something, we have this artist route, we have this artist template. It's totally blank, so like that's why we don't see anything, right? Here it is in all of its glory, just another outlet. So let's go ahead and like let's put something in there. Uh, so we can pop that right in here, right? Again, just another template. We're basically just like using these nested divs and template to make use of my awesome CSS and kind of announce like where each file is coming from. So we can flip back and you can say this is artist HPS. Let's do one other thing real quick, and we'll uh, give ourselves a link in the index template uh, in order to get back and forth. So in here, we're just going to change this by throwing a link to, to the artist. So I can go to localhost 4200. When there's nothing to put in that outlet, well, we get index.hps. When we go to our artist, well, now there's something to put in that outlet in the application controller, right? Um, there's nothing. There's something, the back button works. We're not actually leaving the page. That's the history API, it's magic. Don't worry about it. Um, so as soon as we have something to put in there, that's the role that the index HPS like begins to fill. Is this, well, we have nothing to put in the outlet, there it goes. Okay, so, and you also notice that we changed the URL, right? And the idea is here, like, the other thing that web, like JavaScript applications do that annoys me to no end is you find like a really cute cat meme and you want to send it to somebody and like, that whole, like, there's no URL, so they get sent to the homepage, right? The idea is if we go to slash artist, the router kind of looks at everything past that slash, figures out what routes it needs to get, figures out what templates it needs to fire, and can give us back to that awesome cat meme. Um, super important. Big change on the web. Um, so here's, here is the point where we are going to actually use our one route of the night. Um, and what we'll do is basically we want to get all of our artists from uh, the database, right? And we can flip over here and we can kind of see that we can go in, we have a model, a model file, I'm sorry, a route file that currently goes and gets nothing. We're basically gonna say, Kyle showed this earlier, he kind of explained this, um, go to Ember Data, find all the artists, right? Which is actually gonna fire an Ajax request to our server, which is gonna ask it for all the artists, all the artists are gonna be sent back, Ember is gonna figure this all out. Right? We don't have to worry about it. That's the extent that it will be all the Ajax we'll be writing tonight. And we're not even writing it. Like something else is doing it. It's fine. Um, cool. Uh, if you want to be cool, you can do the ES6 syntax. Right? Be a hipster about it. <laughs> it still works. Um, and there it is. Uh, and so now we can see that when we go to artists, we go to data. Oh, look. Actually, it's not a dig. It's mostly I forgot it existed. And when Kyle did it, it's like, I'm going to look like a jerk if I don't use it. I just saw and here I am. doing it and I felt left out. I mean, this is kind of like <laughs> Yeah, it's like by definition, right? The cool kids are doing it. Um, so if we go, like, you can see, and this is a cool thing about Ember Data. Just to, like, I know we're on top of my routes. I promise that, right? Uh, you click artists. There are no artists, right? It'll go and it will. Fetch the artist at that point. We've got three artists. We've got Iron and Wine, Bonavere, and Ray LaMontagne. Right, they got beards, get it? Do you see what we're doing here? <laughs> um, and we have these artists. So the next thing we're probably- What? Bon what? I'll tell a story about that later. It has to do with me being a middle, teach middle school teacher. <laughs> and teenagers think they're cooler than me. They're not. <laughs> um, all right, so what we'll do now is instead of just like showing none of the artists, we'll actually update this a little bit here to like show all of our artists. All right, so we'll just basically, all I've added here is an artist, 
and we're going to iterate through the model, each artist, and we'll just display the artist's name. So far, so good. Let's go check it out. Hey, look, there they are. There's my three artists. They're rendered on the page. Um, all right, so we've kind of gotten the, the first promise done here, which is we can show artists. This is artists. This is all the artists. These two numbered ones are actually have names, right? They're not just like, I'm not going to have a three round, right? But, but the idea of like, what artist? Artist, singular. Like, if I was thinking about this better, I would have used all exclusively like nouns that have different plural forms. Or I would have just used fish. Who knows? Uh, fish and uh, moose. Moose is plural, right? And singular? Andrew, back me up on this. It's meese. Meese. Uh, meese, what else? Um, next, next, next time. Um, so we need this idea of an artist route. Um, but the first thing is, like, if we look at this, of all these artists, we'll see that, well, this has an outlet too, right? Well, what should we put in here? Don't all answer at once. <laughs> we can put an index template in there, right? So this idea, we cut an index uh, route for free, right? But when we actually um, have nested resources, like those, can, those will actually have outlets that can be filled. Let's go ahead first and let's actually make an artist route. Uh, so we'll type Ember G route artist slash artist. So that's what the three stands for. Um, it's going to create a route file. I'm not going to put anything in it, thereby keeping true to my promise. Um, and that changes my router, my routes a little bit, right? Now I've got artists, and they have this idea of an artist singular, right? And so I do want to put something in that outlet. So I'm going to make a new template. It's going to be artist index, All right? The so index template for the artist's plural outlet. Um, cool. And we'll also notice that when I made that route with the generator, it also changed my router again for me. And this is how we do nested resources, right? So the idea we're saying here is that the artist route is nested inside of the artist's plural route. And that's why it goes in here. We can kind of, we can keep this going for as long as we want, right? There's a point where it gets ridiculous, not unlike my CSS selectors from earlier, right? But like, generally speaking, it'll, it'll work for right now. Um, and you can see that it made an artist directory. I've got my index template, and I've got my artist. So when, if we have no artist at all, it's good to render index, right? And if we have an artist that we want to show, then we'll use the artist template. So like index is always kind of like, I don't have anything to show you, right? And it gives us kind of a placeholder. It can be like, select something from the right if you're kind of building like a like master detail view application or something along those lines. So let's put some stuff in there. Um, there is one thing we need to do to the router though, and that is we don't want to find artist slash artist, which if we look over here is what it's trying to look for. Um, that would, we want to actually be able to dynamically pick an artist based on the number that gets put in there. So what we'll actually use is this thing called a dynamic segment, uh, which will basically figure out, based on what number is in there, figure out what artist we should look for. Um, and we can plug that into our router. Oh my god, I'm in the wrong thing. And basically all we say is path. So if you ever wanted to, like, if you had an artist route, but you wanted actually the URL to be like sandwiches, I don't know why, but like you would say path sandwiches, right? Anything with a colon in front of it is a dynamic segment, right? And if you might have seen this from something like Sinatra or Rails or Express, this should look slightly familiar. It's literally stolen from those, right? So it's like the basic idea is from there. And so now what we'll do is we can take our index and we can basically say, we'll just put something in there to like hold the place. So in artist index, put this in here, go back over. You see the nesting is happening. It's working here, right? Um, things are happening. We have our artist and we have artist index until we actually have an artist to plug in there. We have a new nested route and it's using this idea of an index. Um, the other thing is in our actual, we're gonna do one quick change to our artists. And that's just gonna be, we wanna link to the given artist, right? So we'll go into all of our artists and we'll just swap this out. Instead of showing their name, show a link to their name. Right, so this is now linked to artist, artist, and we pass in the artist. Everyone got that? Five times yeah. fast? Um, artist, artist, pass in the artist. Um, and now we can flip over and you can see the links. The one other thing I'm gonna do just before we demonstrate this is I'm gonna have something to kind of like show in there as we get it. So we'll actually say, we'll 
pop into the artist, and all we'll say is basically, oh my god, live coding. I'm gonna change this to H2 because I believe in semantic markup, despite what my notes believe. Um, and here we'll show basically the, the artist's name, and then we'll just again announce what template we're in. Um, cool. So I can go hit an artist, and you can see there it is. I can swap this. And you can see that I got some things for free. Um, you see, like, whichever one I clicked on turns bold, right? And that's because if you go in along with these conventions, what Ember is going to do is it's going to throw an active class on whichever link you've clicked on, whichever route. It knows what model, it's looking at the models, it's iterating over those. Then when you click one, it knows which one you clicked on. It's actually going to throw an active class on there. And if you use something like Bootstrap or any of those other, like, CSS frameworks, they already have an active class, you'll just get it as a freebie, right? And it'll just work. The other thing is, like, you'll notice I didn't need a route that's going like, all right, so when we get to a given artist, go and find, you know, if you think about like the Rails-ish, like even like other Ember apps, all right, go find me just one of this parameter. Basically, Ember is using our URL scheme and the, basically the, the conventions to infer, right, which artist we would want to get based on the URL scheme. It's already loaded all the artists when it worked its way down, right? So if we go back over here, when we get here, it's going to load the application controller, route, everything like that, right? Then it's going to load the artist's controller. And at that point, it's gotten all the artists. So basically, without, if you follow the URL scheme, and you do what Ember Router would like you to do, it's basically going to try to take a lucky guess into which artist that you wanted, right? Which in this part is luckily the artist that we wanted. Right? We didn't need to write extra code. It's all just kind of like inferred for us. And it's kind of one of the advantages you get when you go along with like what the router thinks you ought to be doing, right? Cool. So we can flop. We can switch along. We're not ever reloading the page. So like, if I lost internet right now, I mean, or cut off my local server, like this would all still work. It's got everything it needs, right? Mike, Mike was talking about like, um, you have know, like offline application effect line. This is all just work. All right. Cool. So the next thing we want to do is, well, for an artist, artists have albums, right? So what we'll do is we'll create another route for that. Right, and we'll go ahead and we'll, we're nesting here, we've got artist, the artist, now we're looking at albums, right? And if we look over back on our router, our router has been modified again, and it's been put in there already. So this would be all of the albums to show. Um, but now, artist is also, this idea, artist has something that could render, right? So it means artist like will use an outlet, which means, again, we could use an index template if we wanted to. So we can go ahead and generate one of those as well. Uh, so we do ember g. It's like a little, believe me, but I'm saying artist, artist, index, and a template. Good thing the Google Hangouts thing is hiding it. <laughs> All right. So now if we go in, now we've got another nested directory here. And in here we can kind of, again, put, um, an artist index, I'm gonna have a little extra stuff in here. So on a given artist, what we wanna do is we have an index template in here. And we're nesting deeper, you see where all the CSS tags are coming to save me here, making it very clear. Um, and like, so we show something, you can see that, I'm gonna close this for a moment right here. Uh, if I switch artists, everything updates, right? If you look in the artist biography, you can see that that's automatically updating and swapping out for the given model. Again, we didn't, we're not fetching extra models. We're not doing extra things as well. We have no, we don't have a single controller at this point, right? Ember is doing all this stuff because we're respecting the URL, right? And we can kind of check that out. So the next thing is this idea of albums, right? And so we want to like show all of their albums. We're kind of hitting a flow here. Um, we'll go into the albums. And we can kind of paste this in here. You see a given album for the artist. We do end up back at the index template every time, right? But again, we've had to fetch nothing additional from there. As it turns out, Ember's actually making additional Ajax calls, right? If I go over to my Rails uh, app, right, you can see that like, oh, it got something from bigger, 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 right? It went and got 
the album with the ID of two. And it knew to go get that. I didn't do anything. Again, I'm just following. It knows I have this general set of relationships. When I got all the artists, they said, yeah, I'm uh, Iron and Wine. I actually have the albums with the IDs of like one and two, right? And so when I go to get that artist, it knows to fetch those. And even better, if I go back and forward once I've loaded up the app, it's not going to refetch them, right? It's only going to fetch them the first time, load them locally, and then we're good, right? So we're actually doing a whole bunch of Ajax without actually having to write any Ajax. Right, because literally nobody likes writing Ajax. <laughs> right. Um, Except my students who are doing it next week. <laughs> no, no, no. People have to write Ajax. Nobody likes it. He can make you do it, but he cannot make you like it. <laughs> right. Like, um, cool. Um, so there's some fun stuff here. Like, I would like to show the albums. I can do fun stuff, and this is like kind of a minor deviation, but I can go over. And I can render another template. I can like take templates I have and render them in other places. Um, and this will eventually like break on us. So we're gonna actually remove it. But like I can do stuff, and like like Kyle's gonna have to like control himself not to yell out components. But let's go for it. Um, so I can render the album template here, and I can pass in what I want the model to be. And here we'll actually. Render helper. What? You're using the render helper. I told you to be quiet. Uh... All right, you can see that it'll actually, if we go to the artist, maybe everything breaks. Who knows what happens? <laughs> Woo! All right, ignore that sidestep. It worked, it worked earlier this afternoon. I'm actually in 113. This time I was in 2.1 earlier today. It worked. I, I rehearsed. I'm a professional. <laughs> right, but like. <laughs> um, but like the idea is we're going to stick with this. Um, you know, so now the last part, because I think we only promised you we would get as, because like an individual song, maybe we would show the lyrics. I did make sure, yeah. I am into, oh yeah, nice. All right, so yeah, that's fine. I think they actually did, like, don't care to take the record out. Yeah, I was in 2.1 earlier. I was in 1.3, because like this is a brand new computer. Literally nothing worked. Uh, so I'm actually on Ember CLI, like the master branch right now. So it's like the Wild West over here. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll just kind of ignore that. Uh, we should show song lyrics. We could do anything on an individual song. We're gonna stop at albums and show an individual album because like we can keep this going forever, right? I mean, even go to like lyric line number if we wanted to and get all like genius about this. Let's not. Uh, I think we're gonna make the point very soon. But um, yeah, what I was gonna say. So when I remember it, we'll pop it in there. Um, so we can go ahead, we have our albums. I'm going to take, I took out that render helper. Uh, so we want one more of this individual album, right? So the promise was I was gonna get you to, to here, right? And so what we can go ahead and do is, fix it in my notes before I copy and paste something that doesn't work. What we can do is we can now generate one more. And again, this, is, this should like at some point like, look like the, um, Oh, I can hide this. Let's do it. Goodbye. Um, so we'll make one more route, and that's artist, artist, right? So the number, like, three in our example. Albums, and then a given album. So we can see these songs on that album, right? And there we go. And we'll take another look again, and we can see that in our router. It's been changed one more time. And we've nested yet again. Right, um, so we have this kind of like this flow of the like different segments of our application. And in here, we can actually grab an album. We have all of them. I was actually, turn, we're gonna turn that into links so we can click on them again. That in albums. Right, so it just changed that to a link to. Um, and each time we're passing it in as the model. It used to be in earlier versions of Ember, like you could pass something in and it would work if you followed it, but if you went directly to that URL, like you're kind of out of luck, right? In the more recent versions of Ember, it'll just figure it out all out for you. Again, it's the it's the, the the kind of like trade-off of convention over configuration is it's harder to like do like I want to do this like wild thing that only I want. On the other hand, if you go with the flow, you get a whole bunch of free stuff, right? Um, so here we, we can link to each album, and then we also will have an album template, right, which will just basically show all our songs. Uh, 
Uh, and in here, we'll actually just say, we'll actually generate an index template one more time. Ember G template, and we'll say artists, artist, albums, index. And what we'll do here is we'll flip over to Adam, and in here we'll basically say, let's steal some of this real quick. And we'll only, oh my god. Uh, computers are really hard, everyone. Um, and we'll say this is album index, albums index. All right, so we can go over, we can see their albums, we can give an album. Um, Slightly weird. I pasted stuff in here I should not have. Um, so there's the album title, and we'll grab all the songs, and we'll display each song as a track. Mm. Oh, I didn't. I don't have the dynamic statement. Nobody caught that. Come on. I caught it. I thought you were going to. I thought you knew something I did. Uh, no. Mistake yeah, number is. one. Uh, so we'll say. And one of the things that you can do in kind of the more server side ones, it's like you can just say ID here. But considering we might have any of these going in a moment, you can't have two IDs, right? So you want to always namespace them. Artist 2 album. There's no outlet in there. That was on purpose from the other thing I tried to do that didn't work out. So we'll pop that right here. Other mistake that you will find, unless you're better than me, uh, is you'll forget to put an outlet in there. Keep clicking on stuff and wondering why nothing renders. I've lost an afternoon of my life. This is a cautionary tale to prevent you from doing the same thing. Um, it's one of those things, as an instructor, like a student comes to me, I don't want to feel like fit all you can go like, outlet. Yeah. Skip turbo links. And it always just like works. You seem like some kind of like deity, but really you've just lost like several weeks of your own life on it. Uh, and you're passing that along. Um, so now we can like switch albums, right? And the really interesting part here, and what helps on a big performance level, is like when we switch albums, none of this stuff up here is changing, right? In like a Rails application or a server rendered node application, you're dumping out the entire page, right? All this hard earned markup that you, you worked for, right? You're dumping it out every time and like reloading a new page of the same shit, right? And it's like, well, why did you do that? And they're like, hopefully the browser's cache is. Right? Like, this is literally only changing the parts that need to be changed at a given moment. Right? And we've got this application where we can drill down from artists to a given artist to their albums to a given album and see the songs on the album. Uh, just so you know that I'm crazy. Oh, there's an error. Like, let's not show off about my attention to detail just yet. Lines Morgan on that. Hands up if you were at VirtualCom last night at that meetup. So, this is what we're talking about when it's and uh, that didn't need to change, and so it wasn't updated. Mm -hmm. That's the virtual bomb in action. Yeah, everything that Brendan said, I wasn't there, but like, I'm going to assume I know what Brendan said. Um, <laughs> everything Brendan said, like, React like, only shows you the basic things. One of the things I love very much about the Ember community is React said, like, we actually do this thing way better. So the Ember community said, like, cool, we're going to do that too. All right, and basically <laughs> stole it. So all that stuff is true. Yeah, six months, a year later, but still true. Um, so all this stuff works as well. I was going to show off that all the album times and track numbers were accurate and were the years because I'm crazy, but like my times aren't showing. But the general idea is we created a, like a pretty sophisticated web application, right, with nested routes, with only like really us actually having to write a single model fetch using only the router and templates. Right? There's huge things. There's components that would have done some of these things like in an interesting way. This idea of like routable components that will come one like one day. Um, they're always in the next release. Um, and there's a whole bunch of like other concepts, but it's incredible, like just with one simple concept and this idea that we're gonna follow conventions and like use like if everyone does if everyone agrees with a certain amount of conventions, well then we can make these optimizations and we can make a whole bunch of assumptions and do them for free. Right? And we basically created a pretty like like not, you know, like nested routes, like decently sophisticated application using only like a, the tiniest sliver, sliver of what Ember has to give us. 
Um, so that's everything. Um, thank you. Uh, questions for Steve. Going once. Yeah. What's correct? Is it take arguments or is it just Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Oh, uh, can you repeat the question? <laughs> and then I'll repeat the question. What's correct? Is that arguments? No, it basically just figures out the router is kind of in charge. So the router is what decides what would go in any given outlet. So if like components, you can then pass something into the component, right? And like that would accept arguments. But the idea of an outlet is going to use the next segment, the next thing after a slash in, I didn't repeat the question. No. He said, does outlet accept arguments? Uh, I'm working on this. First, first time uh, Google Hangouter, long time uh, I'm rehearsing. Um, and so like it basically uses the router as kind of the control flow on that. Cool, questions? Hmm? You can name outlets. I'm going to take the confidence in which you said that as, like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can, yeah. and that's what the render I know. I know you're working on documentation now, so I'm going to believe you. Right? <laughs> seems <laughs> seems legit. Uh, <laughs> no, and, that, and that's true. And I actually don't know where the status of that is, is entirely, because the, what you used to be able to do is render into named outlets. I don't know how that works at 2.1. That's one. My of the sense things. is all that stuff is on the. T if it's not deprecated now, yes. it will be. Like my sense is like, yay components, right? And like anything that does like a component like thing will eventually be on the cutting room floor for components, which somebody should talk about next month. Amen. So uh, other questions. What? Nice. Sold, and that's the November meetup. Yeah, we did it. Guys. That's even the November meeting. Oh, okay. I'm so done. That was so much we're done for even next month. <laughs> That's six years now. Uh, so, uh, last thing I have to say about this is the new meetup is on the calendar. We have details to work out about this. We got to know who's doing beginner's track. We got to know who's doing the, the how-to. So if you think that should be you, hit me up on the Denver Devs channel, which is join.denverdevs.com. I heard Dave's doing a beginner track on components next month. <gasps> Dave Daniels Dave? Yeah. He hasn't heard this, but I just made it up. So. Uh, and here, I will be doing surveys in uh, December for how we can make a cooler uh, ever community for 2016. <laughs> So I, I, it's like literally going to be a Google Doc and me going, oh, fuck, I've got to get all the meetup organizers back. Uh, so like, when you see that thing in your email, please fill it out. And it warms my heart to see all of you here. This is all of us together. This is Ember. <laughs>